Okay. In 2018, Harad Asimi joined the PRIF Consortium as an international PhD student to work on a real-world optimization project and learn more about optimization science. Harad concluded his PhD in January and submitted his thesis two weeks ago. Hey, that's oh no. That's <laughs> He has improved his communication skills and realises that he enjoys facilitating bilateral partnerships between industry and academia. Harad is now a researcher at the FBI CRC, working on replacing diesel trucks with electric ones to eradicate greenhouse gas emissions in Australian mines. On top of that amazing news, Harad also got engaged. Congratulations, Harad. And of course, I assume we'll all be invited to the wedding. <laughs> Excellent. Harad, welcome. Thank you. Let me find out how. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Today I would like to tell you about how we can um, how we can inspire from nature to manage the stockpiles more efficiently. The infinite monkey theorem states that if you put unlimited monkey in a room and give them unlimited time and uh, a typewriter, as they hit randomly on the keyboard, they can write down the complete works of William Shakespeare. Richard Dawkins, the British famous evolutionary biologist in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, suggests that uh, infinite monkey theorem is a bad analogy for evolution. To test the concept of evolution in this perspective, he designed an experiment. He designed a computer code that, to, uh, that starts from a random phrase and wants to see that how gradually this random phrase can be rich, the target phrase, me thinks it is like a weasel, which is a phrase from Shakespeare's work. So to do this gradual improvement, he considers the a starting random phrase and he copies it and he also duplicates it and he copies it with a, with a, a small chance of error, which is mutation. And between the duplicate and the mutated one, he chooses the one that is more similar to the target phrase. So the mutation here is that some characters may change in the phrase. And he shows that after 64 iterations, the target phrase has been achieved. He states that life results from the non-random survival of randomly varying replicators. So the non-random survival here refers to that choosing between the mutated one, the duplicate, and the, uh, the copy. And the uh, randomly varying replicator here is the mutation operator. So this project aimed to model and optimize the runoff minus stockpile recovery. There are multiple challenges for stockpile management. Uh, such as they have difficulty in planning reclaim sequences to determine blend with good accuracy to ensure that undesirable properties do not exceed the limits, adding in, in confidently adding lower grade or into a blade or even plan if an unforeseen event was to occur. So imagine that we have a stockpile using the GPS data laser scanning model and the legends in ATP4, we can convert it to a discretized model. And this discretized model has been composed of cuts. So each cut, we know that how much is their tonnage, where is the location, what is the grade of good material there, and what is the percentage of the bad material there, such as uh, or any of fellow. So the other Technical restrictions and end user preferences include recovery costs. So we know that how much does it cost? How much does it, how long does it take to move a machine from one point to another point and spend time on reclaiming the material? Delivery requirements, what is the uh, customer request at the end of the supply chain? Safety constraints, how close we can bring these machines close to each other? 
And Persian consonants, we cannot take a second bench before we take the first bench on top of that. So if we have all these, the tentative schedule should be something like this. So here we see three reclaimers that the boxes are referring to those cuts. The colors are the different stockpiles. Here you can see different three colors, so three stockpiles. And the numbers are the location of those cuts. And you can see that at some time that is spent, first delivery has been planned, second delivery has been planned, and so on. So the question here is that how we can schedule these reclaimers to take these cuts while we reduce the operating costs and avoid undesirable properties. Can we inspire from nature? The answer is yes. Ants, when they want to find food, they start from the nest and they do random walk around. When they find food, they come back to the nest and they deposit some chemical material, which is pheromone. Other ants can sense it. They go through the pass. As they find a shorter pass to the nest or a good pass to the nest, as more ants come and return frequently, the pheromone is get strengthened and the pass gets dominated. So they have fine food and they have uh, used, they are getting maximal benefit using their collective behavior. Marco Dorigo has shown that this for aging behavior of ants can be represented in mathematical platform to solve an optimization problem. So for our problem, ants plan some schedule at the beginning randomly for the reclaimers, and iteratively, as gradually as you saw in the second slide, in a, in a similar concept, they use this collective behavior and improve the schedule until they reach a good schedule. So here we have the stockpile, the restrictions and end user preferences. So we will have a problem model. We give that info to the ant colony optimization algorithm. And at the end, we would have the RAM stockpile recovery schedule for all the reclaimers. So key findings in this project has been that we model the stockpile management problem as a scheduling optimization problem. The benefits are uh, prioritizing, avoiding financial penalty fees over other end user specification and ensuring that undesirable properties do not exceed certain limits. That was our main priority. And we also observed that iterative algorithms such as ant colony optimization algorithm can construct an efficient schedule that improves the decision support. So the usefulness for end user is that they can reduce the operation cost they can schedule deliveries with good accuracy. They can perform rapid decision making for planning stockpiles, and they can maximize value and productivity. So, for future works, the reclaiming does matter, but reclaiming and the stacking should be considered together for a dynamic simulation of the recovery and the stacking. Another Important aspect is that human in the loop is important to obtain more efficient and practical solutions with respect to end user preferences. So we need to consider human knowledge in the design. And improving the algorithms with respect to foresee what are the up in, upcoming balance for a long-term planning. So uh, I would like to thank uh, my supervisors for the guide, uh, Frank and Marcus, uh, translation partners Ben and Chris for the cooperation, uh, other students and postdocs in PRIF for the moral support, and the uh, PRIF uh, consortium for funding this project. Before I conclude, I would like to say that where I am right now, uh, I have been joined as a researcher to mining operational vehicle electrification project, which is, a, which is a conducted at Uni Adelaide uh, with support of funding from Future Battery Industry CRC. What we would like to do is that we would like to study how we can replace diesel trucks in the mines, that they are using lots of diesels and uh, producing lots of emissions with electric trucks. But to Make it happen, we need to find out how much battery we need to put on the board, when, where, on how this battery should be charged uh, without losing productivity, 
uh, what is the required energy infrastructure to provide clean energy sources for these uh, electric vehicles? And more importantly, what are skills the future workforce of full electric mines may have? Uh, thank you for listening. Excellent, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a question for you. I can't get away that easily. <laughs> I tried. I was going to ask you, what have, you, what have been your main challenges for solving the problem? Who? Um, the main challenge here. <clears throat> for me, as a PhD student, uh, was that to understand, because you know, the industry people talk in another language, academic people in another language. So to make this bridge between the uh, industry language and academic language was the main challenge for me, uh, I suppose. I think that's a very good answer because I think that's actually been a fundamental thing at, you know, at the heart of the proof and many other projects as well. You've done a great job, thank you. Thank you, cool, thank you. Next, Professor Peter Dowd will overview Yusha Lee's and Amir Adeli's projects. Yusha Lee concluded her PhD in January 2022 and moved to WA. Yusha is now working full-time for Rio Tinto. Yusha is expected to complete her third paper and submit her thesis by July. Dr. Amir Adeli was a postdoctoral research fellow at the consortium. Amir successfully completed his two PRIF projects in March of this year and while working full-time in a mining company in WA. Uh, Yusha and Amir have provided posters to highlight their project outcomes that are on display in the foyer, so please have a look during the breaks. Welcome back to the stage, Peter. Well, I have the honour to present three brilliant projects. I have the difficulty in trying to tell you about them within 15 minutes, so bear with me. Uh, these projects are circled here. They're in the lower end of the value chain. Um, the, well, two research projects and one translation project. The first one is Yusha Li's project, which is resource heterogeneity modeling for optimal ore extraction. The research problem is how can we adapt models by, you have a resource model, you get rapidly generated data, and you now need to update it. If you use traditional methods for doing this, this might take several days or maybe a month in an extremely large model. What we need to be able to do is to change the state of that model in near real time so we can make real time decisions. So the research question here was, can the resource model or some components of it be updated in near real time to allow near real time decision making? To give you, this is a very simple example uh, from Yusha's work that demonstrates the problem and the solution to it. So you have a block scale model, a large block you see here, and you can look at that on the scale of each one of those blocks, which is the one on the top, on the right. You now are about to mine one of these blocks and you take some more samples for blasting or for other purposes. So you now have information on a much smaller scale. How can that information be included in the, in the model so that you can make a real-time decision? How do we do this? We use a technique which is called uh, a Kármán filter, sometimes a variation of it, a, Kám a Kármán uh, ensemble filter. It's a technique that is uh, basically an iterative mathematical process. There are various versions of it. It's this technique that's been used in many other fields of research and been demonstrated uh, to have a significant impact. So we treat the ore body that we're looking at as being in a particular state at a particular time. When you collect new data, you change the state in that time. And as I said, that time could be so long that you couldn't effectively use the data, or you can use a technique such as the Kármán filter to update that model in real time. So here is an example. 
This is, the example is done to demonstrate the technique. So we have an ore body, we measure the characteristics of that ore body, and based on that data, we can simulate the ore body. So at the simulated locations, where there are real data, they will match the simulation. But in between the real data, you'll get a simulated version of it. So that's one possibility of the ore body. You could run a hundred of these, and that gives you a library of possible con constructs within that ore body. And this is a fairly standard technique in geostatistical applications. You could now mar uh, d drill that ore body. Imagine you're just drilling it, so you can maybe see the black dots on the left-hand side, and you take that data out of the simulated ore body. You now have information on a smaller scale. How can you now update that resource model in order to make these real-time decisions? So here is an overview of that demonstration principle. This, this is demonstrating how the technique works. Of course, if I'm going to apply it to a real ore body, we'd have many more of these. So you simulate a realization of the ore body based on the drill core samples on, or on whatever data you've got or on whatever scale that you're fixed at that scale and that amount of data. You now take a prior model, so someone just defines the size of the block that is going to be mined. So just to make it simple, we've got equal blocks. That, that is the average of those grades, simulated grades in each one of those blocks. You now update this and downscale to the size you want. So if I want to make a decision on this particular block, do I mine the entire block and send it to the processing plant? Or can I discriminate on a smaller scale within that big block? So that next part of it there is to up, update and downscale to various sizes. That is, you might want to test, can I mine on a three by three meter block, a four by four, a one by one, and so on. You then can outline the, the OR limits on the diagram on the right hand side, and then you can transfer that to uh, an estimated re realization. So you can now compare a reality, which, which is a possible real version of your raw body, and if you had a hundred of these, you must probably encompass all possibilities, and you can demonstrate the use of this in terms of recoverability. So these are the results of that simple, call it simple, but it takes a long time to run all of those, uh, updating model. So on the top with the light gray, you have ore that is classified as waste in the prior model, that is if you're looking at 50 meter by 50 meter blocks, or 20 meter by 20 meter blocks. You, that, is a definite, that is an amount that you've classified that as waste in that prior model. Then you look at what you can get in terms of uh, classifying ore. That's waste that is classified as ore in the prior model. Now look at what happens in the simulation. You get ore that is classified as waste in the updated model and waste that's classified as ore on the updated model. So on that simple demonstration, this is a significant impact. The difficulty in all these sorts of things in mining operations is it's relatively straightforward to generate data. It's much more difficult to use the data when it's appropriate to use it. And these are techniques that allow you to do that. So what did it do? It, firstly, it provides a means of updating the resource models in near real time, using information as it's collected virtually. It improved the, this specific version of it improved the rapid updating method and allows you to make application of this in a range of cases. For example, you might want to update multiple variables, not simply one, say copper, iron ore, and so on. You, it delivered a significant improvement in mining selectivity and recoverability, and it's delivered a framework to evaluate the, the relationships between mining selectivity, that is what you can select and make, make, increase your profit with, and the scale, which is the mining unit size. That has led to uh, two papers with a third one in progress. The next two of these projects are by the same researcher, uh, uh, Dr. Amir Adderley, Adderley, who is a postdoctoral researcher, or was a postdoctoral researcher, now works for a mining company. Uh, the first one on here is a translation project, and it's a geostatistical approach to validating geological logs. So we're back to one of the presentations that we had this morning. 
The aim here is to design geostatistical tools, models and algorithms to validate geological logs. A geological log is an individual's understanding of what they're seeing visually. We now need, that's a qualitative variable if you like, because if three of us did it, even with good, good ge geological backgrounds, we might come up with three different answers, as you saw in Unies' presentation this morning. If we can identify using a quantitative covariate, that gives us a way of identifying suspicious samples and doing something about them. The benefits of this would be to improve the quality of resource models. Uh, and as I might not have said, uh, this has a poster outside and Yusha has a poster, poster outside as well. So this is the workflow for doing this. You have geological logs collected by a geologist and assessed by a geologist. But you also have, certainly in the case we're dealing with here, geochemical analyses, which would give you a much more accurate description of what you have in terms of quantitative covariates. And you have a set of drill holes. The goal is to validate the logs, that is, determine which ones are suspicious and identify them and move them. And I should say this project was undertaken in collaboration with geologists on the prominent hill mine site. So we know exactly who was doing the individual recognition of what was on there, the qualitative variables, and we also have the associated quantitative variables. We look at domaining, that is domains of specific types of mineralization within the ore body, and then we look at covariance modeling between uh, those and cross-validations. That is, take one out, estimate it, compare the difference, put it back and repeat that. And calculate then some sort of a consistency measure for each possible log class. Uh, the, the, the system is constructed so that the geologist can intervene at any stage with this. So this is a workflow. You select a drill core sample, which has a particular index, and you assume, or well, the geologist assumes, it belongs to a particular rock type. You then co creed sorry for these terms if you're not familiar with them, these are uh, well-known geostatistical methods using spatial characteristics to estimate uh, different characteristics. It's widely used in the mining industry. So co creed means you're going to co-estimate with two variables. co creed continuous variables for each drill core sample using all surrounding drill cores. That would be all surrounding drill cores that are spatially correlated with the one that you're looking at. Then you obtain uh, a vector of the predictions, and in this particular case, it was a 31 by 31 variance covariance matrix of what would be error, co creeging errors, that is, the difference between the estimate and the true value. You then determine using various statistical tests whether this is a true value or a, suspicious or a suspect value, and you repeat this for all of the categories that you have. So this is the outcome, and I won't bore you with all the detail on here. You can see down here we have a column giving all the elements that were involved in this and a set of rows which represent the different domains for the ore body. And that, was, that is the final output from the test run. That test run was, again, checked with the geologist on site and there was broad agreement with the approach and with the outcome and the identification of uh, mislogged values. So the research outcomes here are, Amir has provided an algorithm uh, for which the performance was independently, if I call the geologist independent of the process, uh, evaluated with 23 different combinations of, of variables uh, times domains. In this particular exercise, which was the demonstration exercise, 1.6% of the assigned categories were deemed to be suspicious and ultimately the, the geologist involved agreed with that. You could also change geographical distances in this. Um, these are getting into the details of, uh, of creeging now uh, and looking at the reliability in terms of p-values. There is some further work to be done on this. Uh, it's primarily to complete this. We did this for 31 different categories. Uh, there is a total of 73 combinations, which would be 
simply a trivial run now because the program is, is, uh, is uh, validated and operational. And we would also like to investigate the possibility uh, of including geometallurgical data in the model. And geometallurgical data bring me to the next project, uh, again by Amir, and this is to predict, predict geometallurgical recovery, or metallurgy if you like. The difficulty with this is that most of our resource models are based on what is in the ground, but some of the properties of what you're mining depend on what you're going to do with it in the end. And one particular part of this is, what is the metallurgical recovery like to, likely to be? That is, if I have a block of ore here, I know all the geological characteristics of it, I know what's happened in terms of mining this and turning the, the mine block into a pile of rubble, it's now going to go through a processing plant. What I would like to know is what is the metallurgical recovery going to be? You might think that's a fairly simple uh, question to be solved. The problem is that metallurgy is not an additive variable. I can't take an average of two, uh, two concepts of, uh, or two values of metallurgy and expect that to have a meaning. There are quite a few variables like that in mining. If we resolve that one, what's the best way of estimating the recovery? Well, first of all, because it's not ad additive, we have to turn it into an additive variable. And there's a very simple way of doing that. The recovery could be calculated as those, either of those two ratios, where in this WF is the mass of metal that is in the feed that is going into the mill, and WC is the mass of metal in the concentrate as it comes out. Well, in order to do this, we need some data. The secondary research problem is to assess the various forms. Again, we're going to use geostatistics, creeging, and select the one that has the best performance. So these are the data that were available. This is a, a plot, three-dimensional plot. Um, and it, these, the values you can see in there are the color-coded ones multiplied by 100 on the right-hand side. This is a spatial distribution of the data from the ore body that were used to conduct, conduct batch flotation tests. Mm -hmm. So this is the end product. So for those particular values, we know what the values were in place, the grade values, and we now know what the recovery process generated in a concentrate. The major data we have, of course, if you had that all the time, there'd be no problem, but you don't know what you've, you've produced until you've actually produced it. So the problem now is using the data that you have, these are drill holes, uh, there are thousands of them in here, and in order to be able to see some of them, you can only see 10% of them on this diagram, but it's meant to be illustrative. So if you mine in one particular place here, you have those specific data. This is the grade of this drill core in this particular location. How will this now transfer into uh, output in concentrate? Well, this is the, the mass of metal in, uh, in the feed on the left-hand side and the mass of the uh, material in the concentrate. They look very similar to one another, but you'll notice that the, the uh, area is quite different. These are prediction maps used using co creaging And which method would we use? Well, if you're not in, uh, familiar with geostatistics, uh, these terms might not mean much to you, but there are many different ways of spatial estimation based on the same type of uh, technique. Uh, simple creaging, I won't go into the reasons for these, simple creaging, ordinary creaging, um, what have we got there? Sim uh, simple co-creaging, that is creaging with at least uh, two pairs, and uh, co-creaging with related means. And the best, without knowing what geostatistics is about, everyone can tell me that the final one must be the best. So that, that was part of the exercise, and it was part of the final model that came out of it. So the outcomes here were that Amir delivered a new algorithm that allows you to predict metallurgical recovery, and he successfully tested it on the Prominent Hill IOCG deposit. The algorithm eliminates biases that are caused by heterotopic, that is, if you have different variables, some of them are measured at some locations and some are not. If it was otherwise, it would be that every location had all variables measured. 
So there have to be preferential sample, sampling uh, designs. The research outcomes were published uh, in Minerals Engineering, uh, which has an impact factor of 5.48, and this particular pro um, pu publication was selected by the Vice Chancellor's, um, I'm not sure what he calls it, but it's a, it's a, uh, a process in the university where he, ident he or people who work for him at least, identify good quality publications and they put them in a special rank. So Amir's paper was ranked in that section. So very quick overview, um, happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Peter. Simon Ratcliffe from MapTech again. Um, regarding Amir's second project, I, I assume that if you have two or more mining locations that are open and you are you know, stockpiling those locations and perhaps then blending those locations into the plant, you, you could predict the recovery of the blend as well, right? In principle, you could. The technique would have to be adapted to that. This was a, a demonstration project, if you like, uh, of what's capable. But given that he's now demonstrated that you, you can do this, providing you have the locations where you've got the variables that are required for it, uh, we, in order to answer your question there, would need a bit more work to do that ad adaptation. Hmm. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks, uh, Peter. Some terrific work there. My question's about the first project you talked about uh, and specifically the, the first image you had, I think, was a, um, takes us to an interesting place. And my question is maybe to you and the audience about are we getting to a place where we don't have to do the infill drilling to define that the, the more granular nature of the ore body where we can use some other techniques like uh, imaging techniques uh, on the ore faces or the, or the benches uh, in order to provide um, that level of granularity. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think that carries much more into the training set of projects where on the understanding we would have those sensing techniques available, being able to integrate those with the corresponding hard data. Yeah. So at the moment, this, this is a simple demonstration project. So if this was a, an open pit uh, operation, this, this, the collection or the drilling of those individual holes is, is much more accessible. And you could, you could construct uh, an application of this which would work in near real time. It becomes a bit more difficult underground, but it, it can be adapted to that as well. But as you say, if you could have image visions of this, it would be much more quickly available and presumably cheaper. We'll uh, leave it there. Thank you, Peter. That concludes the Consortium Program A presentations. Uh, we now have time for any discussions and questions related to the Program A of the Consortium. First, we'll go to our online audience. Linda, do, you, do we have any questions from our online audience? No, so it's open to the room. Any questions that you held back during the morning, please? Kirsten has a microphone. Kathy's got one. Hang on, Kirsten's just behind you. Thank you. It was more for Anita's um, presentation. There, there's follow-ups on everything, but we'll, we'll start with Anita's and, and a kind of a follow-on from what Gavin was talking about. One thing that ge geoscientists face in the mining environment is, I well, think back even step further, the further you are away from the point of revenue generation means final product, the more difficult it becomes to um, justify spending any money. You know, because in a process plant, I can say I can add more reagent and I'm going to get this guaranteed outcome. I have a recovery. It has so much cost. When you go back to geoscience, which is a lot of uh, 
a lot of variability and uncertainty in that. It's very difficult to say if I drill one other hole, it's going to give me generate me this amount of money. But it's an incredibly important question. So the the looking at the um, the discounting that Anita did, which was fantastic. The question that, that a geologist often faces is, by putting in more drill holes, how much of the how much uncertainty how much how much am I going to reduce that uncertainty, and then that allows them to justify drill holes a lot quicker. So, incredibly interesting on what the Nita and bunch have done, but it's still it's still to turn that question around a little tiny bit and ask it slightly differently is how could I use that style of information to to better justify what I'm doing to actually reduce the uncertainty and see how much it's going to cost me to reduce the uncertainty. And, and this is where the mining side could jump in. Um, the way I vision the, the ap applications of that discounted one is actually, it doesn't drive the mine to give a better outcome. What it does is it drives the mining engineers to go to the area that has the highest or the lowest uncertainty, the lowest uncertainty, that's right, or the highest certainty. <clears throat> But that's driven by the data density, frankly, you know, and just because you have a lot of drilling in an area doesn't mean it's the best choice to be at or anything like that. So it's just kind of a thought thing to think about. Depends on what your perspective is and what kind of answers you actually have. So the biggest value add is actually up at the very point, at the front point, when we're actually drilling holes. And that has a significant value add because drilling actually gives the business optionality. Um, Mining engineers don't discover ore, geologists do, and we need everything, all the tools that we can in order to justify what we do. We don't want to overdrill either, you know, and overdrilling is not good, but we add optionality for the business. You know, the mining engineer is not improving the optionality. We do that by presenting ore opportunities for the mining engineers to make decisions on which ore they're going to move. So it's just kind of a general, general waffle. Thank you, Kathy. On the way, Simon. Kathy, just to respond to some of your comments there, which I think are, are great comments, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the approach that we've taken with the, the project with, with Frank and Anita. The disconnect between the geological uncertainty and the effect on the the profit, the revenue, the bottom line at the end of the period, yeah, that's a very real thing. And there's a there's a lot of complex machinery linking the two together, um, just in the software space that I'm familiar with. You know, the, the mine planning software, the geological modeling software, and then the the scheduling, long term strategic scheduling software, medium term scheduling software. There are all of these moving parts, and to make that machinery aware of the potential for multiple geologies and to look at the uncertainties inherent in those different realizations is a it's a big project and and so i guess our philosophy there was to take the the strategic scheduling component that can show economic variables changing very clearly with geological uncertainty and use that as the conversation starter around driving drilling programs, around driving mine planning software to accept more versions of geological reality as a way of, if you like, getting the focus on the potential financial benefits that might come from better mapping or understanding of your geological uncertainty so yeah, I think this work has really kick-started a, a start on, on getting that larger house in order. Um, and I think that's an ongoing area of work. So I really appreciate your comments because uh, they're spot on. The world we face uh, is a, a mining engineer sees a block model and 
they have no clue what actually, to them a block is a block and it must be all equal certainty across it. So what you guys are doing is a good thing. You know, it gives them a rapid visualization of it, but, and, and the, the more tools we put in their hands to actually understand that all blocks are not created equal, um, that helps, so. So I'll pile in on the commercialization side. I think a really interesting piece is how many different types of organisations that provide information to mining companies could benefit from the outcomes of this research. So I think, Gavin, your question earlier about the uncertainty, rather than getting more certain, having the question of, well, how much more confident could I be if I did more drilling? So to like answer the, the question from the other side of the room before, um, justifying to someone who's going to provide the in-drilling services to the mine that it's actually worth spending that money is important for their business and therefore the outcome of this research could be helpful for them to partner with the software company to say you know what we can tell you this much and we can be this certain but if we did this we could also provide you greater certainty in your decision making so there's one economic pathway or opportunity i like the that conversation, I mean, a mine engineer looks at a block model, it's kind of like the difference between a pilot and a flight engineer in, a, in an airline, right? A flight engineer worries about a thousand sensors and if the plane's going to fall and the pilot's got a check engine light. So, you know, the, the translation of what goes on in between, it's people need to recognise the importance of everyone in the journey, not just the pilot. So, you know, how do you add value to each step along the way? But just think about how you monetize some of this. It's, it's where my head's at. With that commercialisation advice, we will conclude the discussions and questions for Program A. Thank you for the roving mic. Thank you to everyone for their contributions and questions. So we will now go on to Program B of the consortium and introduce Professor Bill Skinner, who is the PRIF Consortium Program B leader. Bill is a research professor at the Future Industry Institute at the University of South Australia. Bill has over 30 years of experience in surface science research with 24 years in relation to mineral processing. Bill celebrates 30 years at the University of South Australia this year, working on physical and chemical processes at surfaces and interfaces. In particular, mineral and material surface chemistry together with forensics, environmental science and biomaterials. Bill's biggest personal achievement during PRIF was refurbishing his 1965 Echo Barracuda, a guitar. <laughs> Bill. If only I could play it properly. First, let me say I feel really privileged to be amongst the elite and the intellectual giants that all turned up at the wine centre this morning. You know who you are. <coughs> Okay, so um, prog <coughs> program B, again, the, the apocryphal um, uh, slide. Uh, program B deals with, from basically from the mills on, uh, grouped into projects uh, around the communication circuit, both the mill and the uh, cyclone, hydrocyclones, in flotation, both looking at plant data uh, and the additional sensor data that is the other half of flotation. Some might say more than half, depending on the particular circumstances, being the chemistry that's going on there. Uh, and then leaching, uh, we've got that as a more as a catch-all because we're also dealing with um, uh, basically solution measurement techniques in, in that regard. So not just useful for leaching, but also in other parts of the plant. And you'll see a little bit about that. <clears throat> so uh, the scopes, objectives, themes. Um, basically, as I mentioned, we, we break this thing up into uh, the program B, up into the grinding circuit, uh, uh, the flotation component of the circuit, and the data arising thereof, and also from what we can measure from the pulp chemistry, whether that be in leaching or in other parts of the plant. Because as you know, you might find something that may not work in one spot, but might work in another and give you just as valuable information. And the approach of this is a combination of <coughs> trying to develop new sensors, uh, for, for new approaches to sensors, uh, utilising the sensor technologies that our translation partners have uh, within their portfolio, 
and then examining how we take this data and how we use it and correlate it to what we're trying to achieve. And what we're trying to achieve is really under those themes there, maximising throughput, copper recovery, uh, metal production, uh, and having grinding and flotation talking to each other um, and maximising uranium by taking care of detrimental effects that might be occurring in the hydromet. As mentioned before, things like uh, iron 2, iron 3 ratio, which can cause gelling or be an indicator at least of a problem mineral coming into the system. So we have five translation projects uh, and we have uh, seven um, uh, research projects uh, either undertaken by students or, or postdocs. Uh, <clears throat> so um, looking at those, the translation projects, five translation projects, uh, one about around uh, uh, the, the actual mill, uh, ultrasonic particle size distribution, pulp chemistry monitor, uh, this MOF sensor, which uh, uh, Peter mentioned earlier this morning, is one of the uh, newer areas uh, to measure um, iron 2, iron 3 ratio, and a laboratory scale, or working towards a laboratory scale uh, ag sag mill, uh, which uh, uh, has been completed, and we'll see further um, development, both in the training centre uh, and, uh, and we hope with Magato as well. Uh, getting, we, it's being used mainly to, to um, validate the, um, the uh, uh, data coming from microphones and vibration sensors in a laboratory sense, uh, and we need to scale it up so that it can also match the mechanical properties of a, or be scalable to a mechanical properties of an egg sag uh, in the end. And then we've got the research projects, seven of those, uh, and uh, you can see We've got three there where a thesis is imminent and uh, the thesis will be eminent as well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, so um, uh, a series of processes there. We have also managed to have basically picked, uh, project six and seven were not necessarily originally in the mix, but due to uh, savings and, and, <laughs> and mainly because of the pandemic, um, we were able to in, uh, generate a couple of new projects including um, and Kirsten, our microphone wielder today, Kirsten's project on uh, a theoretical project, basically on how ions move in sensor materials, a very important aspect of how you then calibrate and quantify in the end. So as Peter showed uh, for program uh, A, uh, we've got the TRL uh, set here. Again, as you, you might expect when you're trying to develop sensors from scratch, they're not expected to be at, at the high TRL level. Uh, but in the translation area, we have some that, because we started with uh, trans translation partner uh, technologies, we were able to uh, add robust and independent view, if you like, um, other than the, 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 the normal translation partner or tech company talking to the end user. We were able to develop things around that and show how they work and also get them onto plant. So um, uh, particularly the, the pulp chemistry monitor had never been at OD before and um, uh, there's some more work to be done uh, with that and now that uh, the site is accessible, uh, I have, um, uh, should acknowledge that for the actual companies, site access has been there, uh, a big bugbear for them as well as us, um, trying to get to site, uh, getting numbers of people to site uh, with, um, with the understandably and, and um, laudable um, uh, conservative view of, of, of COVID. I think it's been great, uh, but we've still been able to get you, get data from plant and work with that, which has been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> yes, the, the ubiquitous mine to metal diagram. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, if you if you had a block model that had each block not only had the properties that the mine was interested in, but the, prop, the processing plant uh, could use to configure changes in the plant operating conditions to match that, that block coming in and to do it, do it on a real-time basis by continuously feeding back information of the processability uh, and the location coming the other way uh, of, uh, um, of, of those blocks and what's in them. Um, particularly like to acknowledge the postdocs and students and um, particularly point out 
Richmond SMR. Richmond has kept this this program B group together, even when his absent-minded supervisor has been, uh, <coughs> say, less than helpful or less than on the ball. I've got to say, um, thank, thank you, Richmond. Fantastic. Um, and, and the students and, uh, as, uh, as well have been uh, really, really good and a very nice family. Um, and let's not forget, this is not just about developing complex ores, etc. It's about developing people as well. So I use this for, to describe what the whole project's about, about taking uncertainty, re reducing that uncertainty to a level where you can actually see an improvement or a, or a decline. Let's hope we can do that with students and, and, and postdocs too, is to um, give them you know, close interaction, a good environment into which to work, good problems to, and challenges to solve, and generate people who can be highly productive, confident, and enjoy what they do, and, and have low stress levels. So, in summary, able to leap tall buildings with a smile. So, uh, or, or take the admonishment of a supervisor with a smile as well. That's another aspect. Take criticism well. So, I'll leave you there. This is the CIs and the and the the end user and uh, uh, and translation partner partners uh, uh, involved in the project. Uh, and um, Thank you, and, and uh, looking forward to your reaction to the, the work that's going to be presented for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. So our first PhD project for Program B will be Kwaku Owasu Boateng, who ho holds a Bachelor of Science in Minerals Engineering and a Master's in Materials and Production Engineering. During his PhD, Kwaku has published nine high quality journal and conference papers and is currently working on another three papers for publication at the end of his PhD study in 2022. Doing his PhD in Adelaide has allowed Kwaku to visit many exciting places in South Australia. I asked him which was his favourite and he gave me three. The Mount Lofty Botanic Gardens, Morialta Conservation Park and the Whispering Wall in the Barossa Valley. All gorgeous places. Kwaku is planning to complete his PhD next month and capabilities and talent, Kwaku is looking for employment. Kwaku, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone present today. And once again, my name is Kwaku Ousu Boating. And I am speaking on the topic sensing and optimization of autogenous and semi autogenous mills. And for my presentation today, I will be frequently using AgMill to represent autogenous mill and SAGMill to represent semi um, autogenous mill. As part of the PREF consortium, my project is within communication specifically the grinding mills. And my study is closely looking at the impact of all, all heterogeneity, that is all hardness and size distribution in arc sag mill operations by tracking the mill acoustic um, responses. The main objective of my project is to use the acoustic sensor to optimize arc sag mill performance in real time. If you visit a mine site and you take a walk around the mineral processing plant, there are substantial noise emission usually concentrated around the um, grinding mill, such as the ag, sag mill, or bore mill. And I'm going to touch base on the opportunity available for using the acoustic um, emission from the mills um, to define the state of the mill, protect the mill, and then achieve optimization. Before I do that, I would like to highlight on some existing sensors for controlling the grinding mills. These sensors include the in-mill sensor, such as the strain gauge sensor, and on-mill contact sensor, such as the vibration sensor. Despite the success of these sensors, they usually suffer, suffer um, 
frequent mechanical breakdown and sometimes unreliable because of the harsh, unfriendly environment of the grinding mills. Now to the acoustic sensing and application in grinding mills, which has been traditionally been employed, uh, where usually experienced mill operators have to listen to the mill noise and then they are able to protect the mill from direct uh, interactions of the balls or ball and liner or lifter contacts, thereby improving the overall mill performance. However, this approach is not also reliable because it is subjective to the one who is listening to the mill noise and making the judgment. Now, capitalizing on the same mill noise emission, our method that we want to propose is to use the acoustic sensor which offers several advantages, such as it provides qualitative and quantitative uh, measurements in real time. There is no male sensor interference involved here, and then the technique is also relatively cheaper as compared to other existing um, methods. And at the end, we are going to use this um, approach to optimize the male performance. Now, why is it so critical that we have to closely monitor the grinding circuit? And I have a couple of reasons, uh, or, or yeah, a couple of reasons. One of them is the grinding circuit plays a pivotal role, in fact, very um, um, important role, that is in terms of the size reduction and mineral liberation, such that the efficiency of all the downstream processes usually depends on the grinding circuit. <laughs> Uh, for today, we'll be hearing some of the um, some um, talk on the downstream process like flotation, which is also part of the consortium. Another reason is that the grinding mill consumes most of the energies compared to all the other unit processes. We can talk about the upstream processes that we have here and the downstream uh, processes. Again, we are also looking at a system which is very hostile, unfriendly and it makes it very difficult to do direct measurement and control. Now, to combine the acoustic sensing and the grinding mill control opportunities, our key research contributions include one different operating condition of the arc sag mill produce unique acoustic intensities or characteristics. Also, different feed or hardness, which is known to cause serious fluctuations or disturbances in axag mill operation, uh, can be differentiated in the laboratory axag mill in real time using the acoustic sensing technique. And finally, a sudden change in feed or size distribution can be monitored and distinguished online in a laboratory axag mill using the acoustic sensing approach. Now, why our research findings are very important to the industry or let's say the mining industry in this case. And I have three reasons for that. One is to, uh, we are looking at a system, the grinding circuit is very expensive to operate in terms of energy, uh, which is very known everywhere. And the improvement or the reduction of energy efficiency or energy uh, as low as 1% can yield significant benefits in price realization and that we can talk about several of thousands of dollars and also saving in the processing cost. The findings are also important because we are able to minimize the disturbances that are caused by feed or heterogeneity, where we are looking at the all hardness and size um, distribution over time. And finally, improving real-time monitoring despite, despite the harsh environment or the, in, the internal inaccessibility of the AXAG mill when it is in operation. Now we are saying that acoustic sensing technology, uh, technique is the most promising approach to solving most of these um, problems. What we actually did to come out with our findings we, first of all, we tested um, different male operating conditions and also analyzing their acoustic intensities or characteristics as a preliminary uh, stage study. Then we move a step further to invest investigate feed or heterogeneity in terms of hardness, where we consider three or hardness. That is the model quartz as the hard mineral, model calcite, 
as the soft mineral and iron ore as the intermediate hard mineral. Then we also tested um, the size distribution to see their impact, uh, the acoustic, acoustic response during um, grinding. We also look at their um, blend ratios, the size distribution, their blend ratios and acoustic uh, responses. And so we have our experimental setup. We have the acoustic signal signature. And we did some analysis, the statistical based analysis, the frequency based analysis, and we did some um, uh, machine learning uh, modeling. Now, for some of our results, which I'm showing um, the, for our preliminary test, this result shows different operating conditions of a laboratory arc sag mill and their acoustic um, response or characteristics. And we can see that the acoustic response of an empty mill or only water were observed to be comparatively negligible. Excessive noise emission were also associated with when we put in only steel balls or having steel balls and water inside the mill. And in these both scenarios where rock or oil samples were added, we saw that the mill acoustic, uh, acoustical levels reduced drastically or reduced them significantly. And this is to show that different mill operating conditions actually produce different mill acoustic um, characteristics. This result also presents two different ore hardness properties where we look at the model cores and the iron ore and their acoustic emission during grinding in a laboratory ball mill. The two ore hardness produce distinct acoustic energy under the same condition. The acoustic condition of the model cores happens to be higher at different uh, frequency bands as compared uh, with that of the iron ore grind characteristics. This also reflected in their size reduction profile such that as, the, as you grind over time and the particle size, redu size reduces, the male acoustic also uh, reduces. This is in contrast, this result is in contrast when the same ore was subjected to arc sag mill operation. So model called iron ore Put, into the, uh, put under the same condition in a laboratory arc sag mill. Here we saw that the acoustic intensity increased continuously with increasing grinding time and also reducing the size fraction. The opposing result that we saw for the two ores in the laboratory mill, ball mill and that of the arc sag mill can be explained by their different operating or working conditions. In terms of the different ore site distribution that we investigated, it was observed that the acoustic response increases with increasing the size fraction. So when there's a sudden change in the, in the size of the feed, there is an increase in the male acoustic uh, intensities. Also, uh, to my right, uh, for the blend ratios where you considered relatively coarser feed size fraction and finer feed size fraction, we saw that the mill acoustic intensity or um, energies reduce considerably as the concentration of the relatively finer feed size fraction was uh, increased. This clearly indicated that the acoustic emission res or response was affected by the blend ratios of different feed size uh, fraction. Now for future studies in this area, we want to recommend that additional work be conducted on different or um, hardness spectrum or characteristics since we only consider just three, the model calcite, the model quartz, and the iron ore. Also, with the promising results from the laboratory scale experiment, the acoustic sensing technology should be expanded or extended to large ag segment operations. Finally, we want to say that this technology should be integrated into the grinding circuit to advancing the industry state of the art in real time. And I want to um, say a quote that was provided by, by um, um, reviewers from pre-concentration digital 
Conference 2020, uh, which was organized by OSIM and CLC. In quote, it says that it is a great to see that at last academia is now studying this as it is a very neglected subject. So there are potentials using the acoustic to define the state of the mill, protect the mill, and achieve optimization. However, this um, approach has been neglected over time, so we don't have so much or extensive research in this um, area. And to conclude, the take-home message that I want to leave with my presentation is that non-contact acoustic sensing is useful and promising approach for understanding feed or hardness and size distribution effect of arc segment as a pathway for solving feed disturbances in real time. And I would like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Asamoa, Professor Max Zanin, Prof. William Skinner, and our end user from BHP, Professor Kati, translation partners, Prof. Grades and Mr. John Karajogos, and all PhD students and postdocs in the PRIF State Government of South Australia through the PRIF RCP Mining Consortium and all other stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Uh, I just want to pick up something Adrian um, Beers said earlier about commercialisation and what you're saying. It's a, an area that hasn't been done and you had some recommendations for further research. But if you want to try and commercialise what you've done here, what do you think might be the next step for that? Um, to, uh, our work was strictly based on um, laboratory experiment. And for us to be confident enough in our results, we have to also test it in the industrial level to see if we can have similar trends. Then we can proceed with its commercialization. Yes. So we, 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 we want to recommend that we test, we have a lot of test work from the industry data level, not the laboratory scale, because there's a bit of a difference. However, there is a potential from the uh, small scale um, experiment. I've got a request to Clark. Next time you show that video, you need to give people a warning because every time I blink, it was rotating a different direction. It was totally <laughs> 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 thank you. Uh, thank you. A reminder to our online audience to add their questions to the Q&A box in Zoom, and we'll get to that during the discussion time. So David Dudas uh, joined PRIF in February this year and is supervised by Dr. Lei Chen, who is a researcher in Program B. David is an engineering honours student conducting his final year project with practical research outcomes in the field of comminution and the efficiency of the mineral processing chain. David's project complements Kwaku's work in SAG Mill research. David. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, my uh, my uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> uh, so my project has been focused also on uh, semiologenous uh, mills, uh, particularly in the health monitoring of. of the uh, wear of the liners. Uh, so here's the image that's probably burned into your retinas by now, and uh, onto the key results. So uh, through this project, uh, we've developed a mill testing pro platform for testing the uh, liner and lifter health monitoring system, which is uh, a wireless accelerometer-based technique. Uh, these accelerometers are mounted directly to the uh, exterior of the drum. Uh, to monitor the localised vibration data uh, along with the angular position of the mill drum. <clears throat> Once fully assembled, the testing platform will be used to tune a model to enable uh, prediction uh, of the liner health from the vibration data uh, collected during mill operation. So uh, why exactly do we bother? Uh, the 
main consequences of line, uh, lift, line and lifter failure are that these components are the primary working surfaces to commute the ore charge. Uh, the mill uh, performance is highly sensitive to the profiles of the liners, and excessive wear can uh, damage the rest of the mill or uh, interfere with downstream processes. So you can see that's an example of a worn liner. Uh, it used to look something more like this. So you can see that it's quite a significant uh, amount of wear, uh, and we want to avoid that if possible. So the limitations of current monitoring systems are that they are either very costly, unable to monitor the location of the ore charge directly, which means that the uh, monitoring system is also sensitive to uh, changes in ore parameters, uh, such as the quality or the hardness, uh, or they're sensitive uh, uh, otherwise to those uh, uh, factors. So the discrete element models are are bespoke solutions for a particular mill, uh, and if they if that parameter hasn't been accounted for, then you're gonna you're gonna end up uh, not your model's not gonna suit if your mill uh, if your mill parameters have changed, or you're gonna have to develop a new model uh, for a different mill. So it's costly to to develop, and it's not a very broad uh, solution. Uh, visual methods obviously you require ceasing the mill opera uh, ceasing mill op milling operations. This is very costly uh, for the plant operator. You can't really just stick your head in whenever you want, unless you don't want to keep it anymore. The acoustic methods are, are unable to locate the vibrations directly onto uh, the, uh, uh, the toe and shoulder charge, uh, locations of the ore charge in the mill. This means that uh, an, acoustic sis, uh, an acoustic method is, is still sensitive to the ore uh, quality. Uh, However, if uh, the position of the peak vibration as well as its intensity is used uh, as what I hope this uh, accelerometer-based system will do, the, the system can be parameterized to just the uh, positional and in, uh, relative intensities of the, uh, of the vibrations, uh, which would hopefully allow for better uh, integration with more systems more easily. So, <clears throat> uh, more on the design methodology for the testing mill in particular. Um, it had to support the mounting of multiple wireless accelerometers directly to the mill exterior. It had to be cheap and quick to manufacture and the mill be suitable for communication. Uh, so, here's the design. Um, I'm gonna quickly just go through it. Uh, the reason why it's uh, made up of so many parts is uh, to save on cost. So most of this is being water jet cut uh, to help keep costs down uh, because milling is expensive. Uh, and so the total mill length is about 506 mils and the inner diameter is 300 millimetres. Uh, more specifically with the liner and lifter design considerations, because this is a smaller mill than what you'd find in industry by a, quite a significant margin. Um, the, the limits of the, 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 the size of the mill require that the liner profile deviate quite a bit. So uh, there's a semicircular or more hemispherical uh, profile that's used instead. Um, that's more optimal for this size of mill. However, that does increase the relative load from abrasion, which is uh, which isn't so useful uh, in this uh, with these accelerometers, uh, uh, and it would reduce the shock loading from the impacts of the to of the of the ore charge falling onto the toe uh, of the charge in the mill. Um, this is when compared to traditional trapezoidal designs used in industry. Um, so that will be uh, something that will need to be accounted for um, with uh, my report uh, later. Uh, so onto the liner design, um, they have a slot on the exterior to allow for longitudinal positioning of the sensor along the length of the mill. Uh, and there's two varieties to just ensure that they can be jigsaw fit together. Um, and the, the lifters themselves still retain the trapezoidal design, but that's more for uh, ensuring proper uh, throughput. We would have a video, but we probably don't have time. So onto the uh, sensors in particular, um, they are these quite little small uh, wireless sensors. 
that can be mounted longitudinally uh, and annually around the, the mill. Uh, and their positions will be uh, kept in track with an encoder. Uh, this, in this case, on this laboratory mill, uh, it would be on the, on the uh, electric motors themselves, which does mean that uh, uh, for a larger industrial solution, the encoder would probably have to be located directly on the, uh, the drum of the, the, the mill. Um, but that, that can be achieved with a little bit of, of effort, but that, that's uh, beyond the scope of that. Um, as for the sampling rate, um, generally wireless accelerometers don't have a very good sampling rate, but that's not so relevant for uh, the sag mills because their, uh, their, uh, their speed of rotation is generally quite uh, low. For an industrial scale mill, you're looking at two revolutions per minute. So the, the frequencies that are of interest are generally of the lower end that this sort of sensor can achieve. Uh, and on to future work that I still have left to do is um, for the, the mill to be uh, manufactured uh, and for the wireless monitoring system to be integrated. Uh, and from that, uh, we can begin testing uh, for, to, to, for the development of a model to verify that we can indeed track the uh, changes. Uh, we can indeed track uh, the wear rate uh, of the liners and lifters uh, with these uh, accelerometers and hopefully this will be done relatively soon. Um, on to acknowledgements, I'd like to thank uh, Lei Chen, my supervisor, uh, and others as well as our uh, end user partners and translation partners, as well as uh, Yibo Liang, who is my uh, peer, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, uh, so thank you. Yes. Um, why did you choose a sag mill that has a length greater than its diameter, which is a South, Afri a South African sag mill, whereas the rest of the world use pancake mills, which have a very short length and a very big diameter? Um, the reason we chose that is to have a little bit more space to work with. Um, the The problem is, is that with the pancake mill, the uh, the sensors would be quite uh, restricted for space. Um, I, I am aware that there is some, uh, with this sort of design, there is a uh, differences of wear rates along the longitudinal length of the uh, of the mill, um, which we can sort of account for by being able to position the sensors down along its length. Uh, but there is there is that uh, concern there. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. Dr. Difan Tang is a postdoctoral research fellow from the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Adelaide. Difan has presented his PRIF research outcomes at two high impact international conferences organised by Minerals Engineering International and will deliver another presentation in the upcoming International Mineral Processing Council Asia Pacific 2022 conference in Melbourne. Stefan is in the final stages of collecting experimental data and refining his models and submitting four research papers for publication. Additionally, Stefan has independently converted his 10-year-old mountain bike to a powerful electric bike. Stefan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to present you a rod. In our project, we turn this rod into a probe, which will help you save tons of money. Literally, if you weigh the cash on a weight scale. <laughs> so what is this for? It is for particle size measuring a hydrocyclone overflow. Hydrocyclone is a part of a commutation circuit. As a classification device, it plays an important role in linking comminution to flotation, as flotation takes its feed from hydrocyclone overflow. Now, why does particle size matter? This is because 
knowledge of particle size information and hydrocyclone overflow not only tells the quality of mu discharge, hydrocyclone performance, and flotation feed, but also greatly help to enable energy efficient comminution and flotation. As can be seen from the figure on the left side, the, for maximum flotation recovery, the particle size is required to be neither too small nor too big. That's useful from the perspective of comminution. Looking at the figure on the right side, we can see huge energy consumption when particles are ground to very fine grains. So if we can grind, we can grind, we can reduce the grinding task by grinding only to the optimal particle size required by flotation, then we'll be looking at some points around the right side of the curves, which are associated with much less energy consumption. Now, how do we tell whether we are grinding to the right particle size. Then we need to monitor particle size. Traditionally, size analysis done offline, which can introduce hours of delay. For optimal control of the grinding circuit, real-time feedback of particle size information is necessary. Now suppose you've got something that can do online measurement of particle size at the central overflow line, where the individual, uh, where the overflow of individual hydrocyclones merge together. And one day, it reports a sudden increase of coarse particles. Then the questions are, where does the problem come from? Is it from the grinding device or from hydrocyclones? If from hydrocyclones, then which unit is malfunctioning? Now it turns out, we need to monitor every hydrocycling unit as well. But the question is, how much will this cost? That depends on the cost of the sensor, the way the sensor is installed, and the, sen and the way the sensor is maintained. There have been choices available, which however, are costly and bespoke. Hydrocyclones are normally arranged in a group, and there can be dozens of all dozens of or even hundreds of hydrocycling units typically installed on a processing plant. That means the total cost can go drastically high if every hydrocycling unit is to be equipped with a monitoring device. In this case, we will be uh, entering a dilemma of whether to remain the traditional operation or to invest on real-time monitoring. So, are there any other feasible solutions? The answer is yes, we have a solution for you. In our project, we have developed a force measuring unit with a probe penetrating into the overflow pipe to measure the force from the incoming slurry. We have found the measured force can be divided in two parts. One is the particle probe impact the other is the flow-induced drag. Further, we have found particles of different size distributions have their unique signature frequencies that are embedded in the particle probe impact events. And size distributions can be also correlated with flow-induced drag in terms of the drag coefficient and flow viscosity. All this information is useful to determine the size passing fraction for target particle size. For example, if you are interested in P80 of 75 microns, then the sensor will give you a reading in percentage, showing the fractions of particles below 75 microns. In addition to the size passing fraction estimation, the sensor can also tell the mass flow rate using force measurement. So one sensor, two readings. This is uh, two in one sensor. To understand the particle probe impact mechanism, we have done dry tests in the air using sand uh, in free fall from a certain height. To correlate drag, uh, flow-induced drag with size distribution, 
we have also done tests with Solari on a small scale flow system using a 50 millimeter diameter testing section. Someone may ask, is it the same case on a full scale system? To, to answer this, we have also conducted experiments on a full scale system using a 150 millimeter diameter testing section. Here is a snapshot of how we process the signals. The figure on the left, has, left side shows a typical time response of force measurement, where you can clearly see uh, the probe vibration. When we transform the signals into time and frequency domain, we can see energy concentrates at low frequency regime, where we apply hydrodynamics to extract drag coefficient and flow viscosity from the measured flow induced drag. But for high frequency vibrations, we use impact mechanics to interpret the particle probe impact event to review the signature frequency associated with different size distributions. Now, the red curve shows the cumulative percent passing of the sand sample we use in experiments, which is done by laser diffraction method offline with a residual error of less than 1%. So we use it as a reference. The scattered dots are the estimation results um, for the size passing fraction for series of target particle size. As can be seen, um, there is no apparent differences among the results under different solid concentrations. That shows good robustness of our sensor, which is not affected by the different solid concentrations. But we do see some error when the particle size start to decrease. That's the limitation of the particle probe impact model, and that brings the necessity of using a flow-induced drag model. With a flow-induced flow drag model dynamically tuned online, it agrees well with the actual size di distribution on convergence. But we still see some error for particles below 30 microns. This is because the appro approximation function we used was derived from statistics. So when the actual size distribution of the sample deviates from statistics, then we will have some error in approximation. But in terms of P80, 70, uh, in, in terms of P80, 700, uh, 70 microns, this approximation still gives us very good results. Now the question again, is it the same case on a full-scale system? Yes. But this time, we can see some error at the coarser end. This is because when the particle size starts to increase, the particle probe impact starts to dominate, and that starts to in introduce some error to the flow-induced drag model. So both the flow-induced drag model and the particle probe impact model should work together in order to obtain good approximation results for the size passing fraction for a target particle size. And the integration of these two models is what we are working on at the moment. Eventually, this new sensor will deliver list, uh, a number of benefits, including its multifunctionality, is potential to be included or embedded in a closed loop control system, and its ease of installation, ease of maintenance, ease of use. And the most important thing is, it's the most cost effective sensor ever. The project will finish at the end of this year, but we would like to do more. This probe with different stiffness is sensitive to different size distributions. At the moment, the stiffness is constant. So it has limited 
further improvement of measurement accuracy. What if the probe stiffness can be adjusted in real time? In this case, we will be able to see a giant leap in measurement accuracy improvement. In the end, I would like to acknowledge the support from the Brief Mining Consortium, the tremendous help from my supervisor, our end user partner, and translation partners. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks for your talk. That, that is terrific. There are so many potential applications for that outside what you're doing, I think. Um, I've got a specific one related to some of the work that we're doing with um, drill rigs where we need to monitor the particle size distribution um, of the cuttings coming out. Um, but um, you said that the constant drag thing was dependent on the flow rate and the viscosity um, of, the, of the fluid. Can you separate those two with your measurement or do you need that independently verified? You mean in fluid environment or in dry environment? Sorry, in, dry, in the fluid environment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, we need those two information together. So those are inputs? Yeah. But if you've got those, you can do particle sizes from millimetres down to less than 100 microns. Below, below 75 microns. Yeah, okay. Terrific. I'll talk to you at lunch now. <laughs> <laughs>